The study of economics can be approached from both a positive and normative perspective. Positive economics deals with statements about what is, which can be tested against facts. It's capable of being verified or refuted by resorting to fact or further investigation. Whereas normative economics deals with statements of what should be and requires value judgments, right, which cannot be verified, um, so it resorts to really subjectivity. Pause the video and read the four bullet points on the right. Try to determine which statements are positive and normative statements, and we'll discuss further in class. Just to dive a little more deeply, um, characteristics of positive statements include statements free from speculation and hinting. They are based on facts that can be proved or disproved. As said earlier, there are no value judgments or subjective judgments made with positive statements. For example, there are very few repeat offenders amongst those who have been executed. This claim can be tested as there are no subjective terminology throughout the statement. In contrast, normative statements are based on norms. A norm is an implicit or implied uh, behavioral pattern arising from the traditions and ethics laid down within the framework of a society. These, are, these statements are subjective, which can be argued based on bias or emotion, and they cannot be proved or disproved objectively. Another assumption made in economics is that people act in their best self-interest, by trying to maximize the satisfaction they expect to receive from their economic decisions. This is why in economics we refer to people as optimizing individuals. But how rational are people when they make decisions in economics? Is the rationale behind this girl eating a cheeseburger um, better than the rationale for this woman eating a salad? This girl is satisfying her taste utility, whereas this woman is satisfying her nutritional utility. Which one's more rational? And, how, and who are you to decide? So this will bring us to logical fallacies, which, are, which can be found throughout economics. The, the first that we'll discuss is the fallacy of false cause, or the post hoc fallacy, or association causation fallacy. And this occurs when it is assumed that because one event follows another, the first event must have caused the second event. In many cases, there may be an association between the two events, but one is not causing the other. An example is the relationship between ice cream sales and criminal activity. In many large cities, an increase in ice cream sales is followed closely by an increase in violent crime. Concluding that ice cream sales leads to violent crime is erroneous. Both events are associated because both tend to occur in the summertime but there is no cause and effect relationship. It is important not to confuse association or correlation with causation. If you've taken my AP psychology class, this is also referred to as an illusory correlation. The next fallacy is the fallacy of division, which occurs when it is incorrectly assumed that what is good or true for the whole is also good or true for the parts. An example of a fallacy of division is concluding that because free trade brings benefits to the economy as a whole, it is also beneficial for each segment of society. The fallacy of division occurs primarily in macroeconomics because it deals with the whole that is made up of many different parts. The opposite may also occur in the fallacy of composition, which occurs when it is incorrectly assumed that what is true for the parts is also true for the whole. A general example of the fallacy of composition is concluding that because a specific group in the economy benefits from a government policy, the entire economy benefits as well. If government decides to establish a national health care program, all of society will be called upon to help, uh, to help for the program. Some groups in the economy may be better off as a result of the nationalized health care, but some groups may be worse off, and the economy as a whole will not necessarily be better off. It should not be assumed that just because some groups will be better off as a result of a policy, that all groups will be better off. That is the fallacy of composition. So economics can be subdivided into microeconomics and macroeconomics as well. We're going to start our year with microeconomics, which centers on the forces working at the individual level, whether it be individual firms or individual consumers and producers. 
It focuses on the needs and desires and buying habits of the individual consumers in the markets. An example of microeconomics is studying how firms react to increasing costs of production by raising the price and subsequently how consumers and household spending is adjusted when the price rises. The name of the game in microeconomics is supply and demand. The next category of economics that we'll cover later in the year is macroeconomics. And macroeconomics focuses on the sum total of all micro parts. It looks at the, it looks at the aggregate or the sum total of individual markets. The four main areas of study are growth, which is an increase in total output, price levels, which we refer to as inflation or deflation, and la labor markets, so in unemployment rates, and the, and the balance in the foreign sector, so exports, imports, and exchange rates, which we'll be covering later in the year.